Good morning, it is Sunday, July 16th, 2023, and I'm Pastor Mark Dillon of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know you and to be known by you, to have the assurance of your great salvation given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we bow before you as our sovereign God and the creator of all that is and ever shall be. And we submit ourselves to your Lordship and we thank you for that Lord over our lives in every area and we thank you for that and so Heavenly Father as we gather here today today in the name of your son we bow before you with grateful and thankful hearts desiring to be taught more about you to know you better and to be prepared for the purpose and work you have for each of our lives and we just simply trust in you to fulfill your plan and purpose in us and we thank you for it for it's in Christ's name we pray amen we're going through the God of the Bible and I, I mentioned I don't know how many of you are aware of a app you can get on your phone or on your smart TV or anything, but it's called Hoopla, like H-O-O-P-L-A, it's from the library. And they have a, a wealth of books and audio books and movies you can download. And there's a movie on there called The American Gospel. And uh, I would recommend just at least looking at it for a little bit. Uh, I think it has some very valid points it's making. Uh, it has to do with the perversion of the gospel. And by the way, most of us know the simple definition of gospel means good news. And the Bible is full of good news. Today we're living in the good news of the gospel of the grace of God and within that gospel there are other gospels within that gospel the grace of God there's the gospel of the church the body of Christ that's good news for anybody that's a member of that there's the gospel of salvation that the message that Paul made known was that now anybody Jew and Gentile alike can be saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing he died for their sins on Calvary, that he bore our sins in his body on that cross. That is the gospel of salvation in the gospel of the grace of God. Now there are a lot of people that say there's only one gospel in the whole Bible, but the God, the Bible itself declares several different Gospels by name. And there's all kinds of good news in the Bible that doesn't apply to us today as members of the church, the body of Christ. And so that's why it's so important that we study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen who needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or correctly partitioning the word of truth and so much of what we've talked about this thus far about the God of the Bible he remains the same in his essence he doesn't change but the way he deals with the human race the different administrations that he has ordained have differing rules and differing arrangements and that seems to be hidden from so many people and that's a little bit what that program's about their very 
much focus. They use the term gospel with just that term without really identifying what they mean when they use the word gospel. And they talk about a certain rather wide segment in the United States that's preaching a gospel that is different from the gospel in the Bible and different things like that, but they really don't name or clarify uh, precisely what the gospel is. And like I mentioned, I believe with all my heart and I believe the Bible supports it, it was committed to the Apostle Paul's trust to preach the gospel of the grace of God. And in that gospel, there is a new revelation about the cross of Christ. When Peter addressed the cross, it was not good news. He pointed his fingers at his fellow Jews and said, you murdered the Son of God. You killed the Holy One. And that's the same thing that Stephen accused them of. And they gnashed their teeth and, and stoned Stephen. The cross was not good news until Paul first preached it in the marvelous gospel of the grace of God. But anyway, that's a little bit aside of the point. Here we're going through the God of the Bible, and we talked about all these Roman numerals, and I won't take the time now to go through each one individually, but I would like to go all the way down to number eight, where it says the God of the Bible is supreme. He is the sovereign God. There is, he is God alone. There's none like him. All of those types of things. And we're going to get into God is sovereign down the road a little ways. But so far we've been just basically talking about the very essence of God. And now we're going to talk a little bit about his nature. And the first one is Number nine, God is omniscient, all-knowing. I am really thankful for that truth. I'm glad nobody else knows what God knows about me. <laughs> I can remember vividly, I can still almost picture the days when I was in middle school. I went to a small high school in a small town and Every once in a while, somebody would get a call over the intercom line. Well, Mark, Gelly, please come to the office. <laughs> and for the next two minutes, walking to the office, I was saying to myself, what do they know? They can't possibly know about that. It just happened last night. I didn't, nobody can know about that. There's something like that. And I get there and it wouldn't have anything to do with that. But it was amazing how I was so thankful that, you know, people look at each other and say, boy, they're really good people. God knows better. We may be good, upright citizens in our community. We may be very philanthropic. We may be very giving and caring. But when it comes to the holiness, the righteousness of God in perfect purity and sinlessness, totally separate from sin, Human beings don't even show up on the measuring scale. They're off the scale. They don't enter into that realm whatsoever. There is none good, no, not one. And I consider it a privilege and a blessing to be to a place in my faith and in my life that I no longer have to fear anything from God because Jesus Christ has borne my punishment he has paid for my sins on the cross. And God knows all about my human failures, my sinful nature, everything else. And he knows every thought I will ever have before I've had it. He knows every motive. He knows it better than I do. There's only one other person on this earth besides myself that comes close to knowing me very well, and that's my wife. And that's scary enough. <laughs> I mean, there are times when we'll have the same thought. I'm sure some of you have experienced that with your spouses. 
some, they, just out of goodness Christ, she says, you know what I was just thinking? And she'll say it. And I said, I was thinking the same thing at the same time. And that's sort of scary. <laughs> but what is really true is God knew what we were thinking before we thought it. That's how omniscient he is. And so let's read Psalm 139, verses 1 through 18. Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. And like I mentioned, it's a tremendous release when you come to your faith saying that there's nothing I can do or hide from God. I can be totally honest with him, open with him, confessing who I am because he is the one that matters. I really don't have much value apart from what God has paid for. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night round me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And that verse is very precious to me, knowing that whatever happens in my life, God didn't cause it all, but he ordained it all. There is nothing going to happen tomorrow that God didn't ordain already. Again, I want to point out, it doesn't mean he caused it. Now, there are certain things that God foreordains. People, he foreordains for certain purposes. And those are guaranteed. And there were certain things that God foreknew. Not just knew were going to happen, but he foreknew it because he already foreordained it. And for me... He knew Mark Dilley was going to be saved way back there 50-some years ago. He knew that before he ever created the world. That's the marvelous knowledge of God. There's nothing. He never has to take a quick breath. Like, <gasps> nothing surprises him. Now, the Bible oftentimes uses anthropomorphic terms meaning assigning human terms to God to help us maybe understand the eyes of the Lord, the arm of the Lord. But our first point was God is spirit. He doesn't have arms and eyes. The Lord Jesus Christ took on human flesh. He does have arms and eyes and all of that. But God is spirit. And he speaks in those terms for our understanding, I believe, more than uh, any real reality like that whatsoever. And then going on, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, 
I am still with you. And so our first point of discussion here is the God of the Bible is all knowing. God knows everything about all moments in time, past, present, and future. Now, there are many people that don't really believe that. There are some that believe that God created the earth, got it moved rolling, and then sort of abandoned it or left it, and just let man then determine his future. Well, I, I don't believe that for a second. I also don't believe that anybody has had a free will since Adam and Eve and the Lord Jesus Christ, those two groups. The first Adam and the last Adam have had a free will without any outside force or power manipulating them. But I think I can show you many, many verses in Scripture where God has intervened in somebody's will, openly control that person so that it, whether he would will something else, he just couldn't because God had control of him. And if anybody wants some references, I can do that for you. So we've read Psalm 139, 1 through 4, but let's just look at it a little closer. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. If you meditate on that and think about that, there's no sense of trying to hide your real thinking, your thoughts, what you're feeling. And in my case, the Spirit of God often illumines my heart to show me how wrong, how sinful, how selfish those thoughts and feelings are, how so self-serving or egocentric my thinking is. And I would be a fool to say, oh no, that's not right. God's revealing to me who I am. I can't hide it from him. I just have to embrace it and thank him for his great salvation. He accepts me completely in Christ. And if I want, if it's my heart's desire to be holy as he is holy, if it's my heart's desire to live a life worthy of my calling, I need to embrace my condition and confess that, Lord, that's who I am. You know me. You've searched me. You know all about me. That's who I am. Change my behavior. Change my thinking. Because the leopard can't change its spots. And then goes on in verse 3 of Psalm 139. You discern my going out in my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. I, I've shared this, but a lot of you probably weren't here when I've shared it in the past, but when I was a teacher, in the teacher's lounge is where you got all the gossip and what was going on with the students and everything else, and there was a discussion about a boy and a girl, and uh, they were talking about some things and they didn't know something I knew. The Lord knew what I knew long before I knew it. But nobody else in the room knew it. And so I was going to share it with them. And just as vividly as the Lord spoke me in words, I was told, don't do it, Mark. And I knew it was the Spirit of God talking to me. And my flesh was saying, yeah, but it, it's just going to break the room up. It's going to, it'll just be an uproar when I say it. Don't do it, Mark. Well, I made up my mind, and this happened, you know, in a second, like. But I made up my mind, I'm going to say it. So I said it. And instead of this uproar of laughter and everything, it was total silence. And the next thing that was said was, and that came from a Christian. When we don't listen to God, he's going to teach us. And he'll take whatever he needs to do to discipline us. And a lot of times, I don't know if you've experienced things where you've had a conviction about something and don't do it, don't do it, and you do it anyway. 
And there may not be any strong reprimand from God, but there will be an adjustment in your life. And I thank God for that. The Spirit of God is working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. And He knows all about us. That's His role. And so it goes on here. You hem me in behind and before you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And so not only does he know everything about us, he knows all of his creation intimately, inside and out. He is the divine architect. He is the divine creator. And so in Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5, it says, He determines the number of the stars. Can you imagine that? We keep finding more and more stars out there, and man saying, boy, aren't we getting great? We've got a telescope now. And it was nothing exciting to God. He just spoke, and it all came into being. And he knew them all. And it goes on to say, great is our, and he calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. I'm thankful that God has made himself known, that he's revealed himself to us, that we can rest in this omniscience. In Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It is my opinion, and this is a dillyism for sure, but in the book of Revelation, at the great white throne judgment, when all the dead, all the unredeemed from all time are all resurrected, and they're going to stand before the judge, and it says, and the books were opened. I believe the books that are open there are the minds of all those dead people. Those people that are separated from God, their minds are going to be open. And all that God knows about them, they too will see once more. And then they will be judged according to the things written in those books. They will be judged according to the experiences they've had in their life. The things that they chose to do or not to do will all be part of that judgment. Now that's just my view on that. But I believe each one of us has a book in there. Now thank goodness our books are going to be opened, I believe, at the Bema Seat of Christ. But what's different about that judgment is the things in our books are going to be judged, not us. Because our judgment is already passed in Christ. He paid the price. He suffered the punishment. He was separated from God for us. And so we're not going to be judged by what we've done whatsoever. Where those at the great white throne judgment, they are judged. Not their works, but they are judged according to their works. And so I'm of the opinion that there will be greater judgments for some than others. In 1 John 3, 19 and 20, this then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. A real good friend of mine used to say, I don't know a lot, but I suspect a whole bunch. Well, I thank God that we can know quite a bit. <clears throat> if you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you've trusted him, you know more than most of the people in the world. God has revealed that to you. Just like when he talked to Peter, remember? He says, uh, who do you say I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ said to him, Man, I don't know quite how he says it, but man didn't teach that to you, neither did you learn it 
but God revealed it. What we know about God today comes because he has revealed that to us. And we should be overwhelmed with gratitude and thanksgiving to God for what he has revealed to us. Now we may, myself, I speak about, I may think I know some other things that he didn't reveal to me. It's just my brain. But I'll still trust him in all of that. Like Paul says, my conscience is clear. Nevertheless that, nevertheless, that doesn't justify me. God is my judge. And so in the end, God will be the judge. And then in Isaiah 46.10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Now again, that is reference to his sovereignty and his omnipotence and that type of thing which we'll talk about later. Job 36, 4, be assured that my words are not false. One perfect in knowledge is with you. In Job 37, 16, do you know how the clouds hang poised? Those wonders of him who is perfect in knowledge. And so God's knowledge is perfect and complete about everything. And then the God of the Bible knows the heart. I cannot tell you how many times somebody has told me, God knows my heart. Like that's a compliment or that's a good thing. But really, if you're not a believer, your heart is nothing to be proud of. And by the way, in the scriptures, the heart is the, the core idea of spirit, soul, and mind combined. But at the time of the Bible writing and everything, the man thought his core was right here, that everything was going on right in this area of his heart. But that red muscle is not what this is talking about. It's talking about your spirit, your soul, and your mind all working together. And so in 1 Kings, it says, Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive an act. Deal with each man according to all he does, since you know his heart. For you alone know the hearts of all men. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father, serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. God knows my motives better than I do. I've said this many times and it's one of my own personal banners. Nobody lies to me like I do. I'll say, no, no, it's okay, when I know it's not okay. No, no, I'm justified in doing this because they did this. I know it's not right, yet I'll lie to me in that and convince myself or try to. But the Spirit of God works in us and overcomes those things. That's his, one of his entire purposes is to overcome the desires of our flesh that drive us. In Psalm 44, 20, if we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Just like Israel, I just revisited some of those things in the Old Testament about the giving of the law. And when Moses first came down from the mountain, he says, here's what the Lord our God has said. And they said, what? All that he said will do. They were all lying. And so Moses was back up, and that's when God gave him the law. And even after he gave him the law, a little while after that, they said, all that our God has said will do. And like that rich young man that came to Christ, remember, and Christ said, uh, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Christ said, keep the whole law. And he says, I've done that since my youth. And then Christ said, well, sell all you have and give it to the poor. And he left saddened because he had great possessions. 
So it's a privilege, it's a wonderful gift to truly embrace that God knows everything about you, all your thoughts, everything else. And that's so far beyond human understanding. Because we can look somebody right in the eye and lie to them and they won't know it. But you can't do that with God. You can't even think dishonestly with God and get away with it. Nobody is getting away with anything from God. And even though we may not remember it, those at the white throne judgment will be reminded clearly of what they did. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. Now this is Paul writing to believers. And so it should also apply to us. We don't have to try to judge everybody in what they're doing and why they're doing it because we won't have an honest judgment. But he says, the Lord will bring it to light and reveal the motives. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. In Luke 16, 15, he said to them, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. And then there's a couple more references to that reference. And then Acts 124, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. When they were adding the 12th apostle back into the group because uh, Judas had betrayed the Lord and left his calling and all of that, they needed the 12th apostle again. And again, a lot of those things, it's hard to just pass over. Why did they feel that was so important? Because they were getting ready for their kingdom here on earth. And there has to be 12 apostles to sit on 12 thrones to judge the 12 tribes during their kingdom. When they were praying this and saying, you know, Lord, every man's heart, they cast lots, trusting the Lord to pick the right one. He picked Matthias, and Matthias was numbered with the apostles. That was all in preparation for the coming kingdom here on earth. There was no revelation about the gospel of the grace of God at that point whatsoever. And then 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. God knows all that are his. And how does he know it? Because he foreordained them. And when did he foreordain them? Because he chose them before the foundation of the world. So that's how he foreknew all those that are his. And so now part C, talking about God knows the heart, the heart of the natural man is totally depraved. That's not a popular position. There, especially in this movie, uh, that they, this film they did about the American gospel, one of the big selling points, you know, you don't make a lot of friends and influence people immediately when you tell them things like, you're sinful and God hates sin. Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Every imagination of your heart is continually evil always. Boy, that all sounds good. I'll give you a thousand dollars and send it in to you. It doesn't happen that way. So most of these preachers you see in this movie are telling people, God's got a little good in every one of us. And that's what he's looking at. He wants your goodness to blossom. And it's all about individuals rather than God. And that's how they sell their gospel. So let's look at some of these. And again, we don't have to be threatened by this because God knows it. He's just telling us the truth. Now we can either know it because God tells us or we can try to deny and say, well, that's not. Like I, had a, I was at a nursing home once and I 
I was preaching and stuff about how man is sinful and really vile before a holy and righteous God and all of this. And I went up to one of the ladies afterwards and I says, boy, I hope I wasn't too rough on you girls. And she said, oh, you weren't talking to me. <clears throat> well, you don't have to be an old person to believe that. But God's talking to every person. Listen to what he says. In Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every, not most, not some, but every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only, not again mostly, but only evil, not sometimes, but all the time. It's really hard to believe that because you guys aren't that bad. I like you. You do some nice things to me and for me and other people. How can God say that? Because he is on a plane way out of our understanding almost. He's, his ways aren't our ways. His thoughts aren't our thoughts. And we need to hear what he says. Here's what he's making known and then say, Lord, show me who I am, if you have the nerve. In Genesis 8, 21, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. Every inclination. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and untreatable, beyond cure. You can't change it. It can't be changed. Who can understand it? The Spirit of God, that's his role in our life. Not to change our heart, but to give us the power and the mind and the desire to do God's will through his power. And that's the difference. Jeremiah 7, 24. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. And they went backward and not forward. And then in Romans 1, 24, which is a very condemning passage. In Romans 1, 24, it says, Therefore, God gave them over because when they knew God, they chose not to know God or to glorify him as God. And so therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And in that passage, two more times, it says, and God gave them over. And it's in that passage where homosexuality is pointed out to be such an abomination to God. Again, the world is trying to say, don't talk about that. Hide it. Don't deal with it. Don't express it. You don't have to say that. Well, if God says it, I don't have to be ashamed of it. If I just read it, that's not hate speech, but that's how the world judges it. I have personally nothing against homosexuals, LBGGT, whatever all those letters are, all of that. That's, that's their choices. But God has something against it, for sure. And he's just going to declare it here. Now, they can either say no or yes or whatever. And should they die apart from God, apart from Christ? Their book will be open at the great white throne judgment. And then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then they will not really have a choice. They will know because God will reveal it clearly that this is part of the grounds for your condemnation. Uh, e Ecclesiastes 9, 3, and 4. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. 
And after they joined the dead, he continued, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. As long as a person is alive, there is a potential hope for that person that God will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. But once they're dead, it's over with. There's no replays. Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, he's talking to Israel now. He says, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought us here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness, or for Israel, because of our righteousness. No, it is on the account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of the land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. And he goes on in other places to call them hard-hearted. God isn't blessing us today in the dispensation of the grace of God. God is not blessing us because of our obedience or because of our devotion. He's blessing us because of his grace. It's freely bestowed. Okay, let's jump down to part D. God has illumined the hearts of the redeemed. And this one also is a very difficult concept, I think, for some people. The prevailing view is God reveals it to everybody. And then everybody makes a choice. And the ones that make the right choice get in. And the ones that make the wrong choice are left out. That's the prevailing view. I don't think it is the biblical view. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, now, Paul's writing to the believers at Corinth. And because they are believers, this is how it happened. God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Again, the argument is, well, if that's true, if God illumined certain people so they would understand and believe, but then he has to do it to everybody. Well, that's to challenge or question God's righteousness, his justice. God's under no obligation to do it to anybody. And that's what grace is all about. He does it to whom he chooses. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will harden whom I will harden. People really don't want that God to be their God. I know one person says, my God doesn't pick and choose. Well, that's the only person that's picking and choosing in the Bible that I can see. It says over and over again, God chose you in Christ. God chose you to salvation. Different places in the Bible, it talks about God electing, making a choice. It doesn't talk about human beings making choices for God. The only place that comes close is Back in the Old Testament when Joshua said, for me and my household, we will choose the Lord or choose to serve the Lord, something like that. But there's no place. Man's heart before he's saved, the heart of the elect are, is just as evil and just as wicked and just as rebellious as the heart of those that are not chosen. There's no difference between we're all the same 
we were, that's what Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. In Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, talking about God illumines things. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now he's asking God to give this. And he goes on to say, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That's a passive verb. You're not going to enlighten your hearts. Someone else is going to. The eyes of your heart be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. In Acts 16, 14, Paul was preaching and he was talking to some women and it says, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloths from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. I don't see how it could be said any clearer that God opened her eyes, illumined her, to respond to Paul's message. And then 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In other words, we can relate with how men think, how human beings think, because we have the same spirit as they do, the same circumstances, the same situation. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand or know what God has freely given us. We don't figure these things out. The spirit of God reveals them to us. Let's go down to Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the gifts from God. We are grounded, rooted and grounded in love. The love of God is resident in our hearts today by the Spirit who lives in us. And so God has done it all. We're not getting any better. What we are doing is our lives may be improving in our walk with God, but not because of us, but because of God's Spirit working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to have these things made known in your word that you have revealed them made known to all who will believe and then Lord it's even more that now your spirit illumines our hearts and our minds that we might know these things but we might believe these things and that we might walk worthy of our calling. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.